The following educational video is not intended to sensationalize the subject matter contained within. Its only purpose is to alert and educate the public to what seems to be a serious and rapidly growing epidemic in our nation. Some of the accounts, descriptions, and illustrations in this video are explicit. Viewer discretion is advised. The climate of fear pervades everything. Nebraska is a state of fear. I got this out in Nebraska and it says, if you can't read it, homosexual prostitution probe ensnares officials of Bush Reagan White House, call boys given midnight tour of the White House. On the back side, it talks about children being taken off the streets of America. Uh, in addition to credit card fraud, the investigation is said to be focused on the illegal interstate prostitution, abduction, and use of minors for sexual perversion, extortions, larceny, and related illicit drug trafficking. Now, when I got this, there's no way I can tell it's the truth, okay? It could be a Xerox thing made up of different headlines, and they could have filled this whole thing in. But I called Paul Rodriguez in the Washington Times. This was run in 1989. And I said, was this the only story? And was this run on the front page the way it indicated? He says it was, and I wrote 60 stories all together about this. And I'm asking you, if a major paper in Washington, D.C. is running headlines about children who are kidnapped off the streets of America being prostituted even into the White House, don't you think that if the news media were disseminating information as they normally would, it would be picked up and run across the country. What would have happened with Richard Nixon if the Washington Post had run the Watergate stuff and no other paper had picked up on it at all? And no Associated Press and no one had picked up on what was going on. That is literally what's happening today. It's very apparent and very obvious that uh, there is a certain degree of cover up there. And um, there's an attempt to quash the uh, what little bit of news that has come out uh, and to slant it and taint it by the various major uh, publications in the state of Nebraska. And mainly because, I think, because the prominent people are involved in this. Uh, the Des Moines Register was very concerned about who was going to be delivering the papers like the next day. And, uh, and they told us we had to find a replacement. We had to find a replacement. Under those situations, I told them where to put the papers. And the press is... <laughs> the press does not want to talk about what's going on. I'm using this means of bringing this information to you because all of the people that I have dealt with in the making of this program have universally said America is censored. America is under censorship. America is terrorized by what is going on. step back and take you back to what happened in Nebraska. We had the Franklin Credit Union. We had the credit union going down. We had people who had money invested in the credit union going to Senator Lauren Schmidt and Lauren Schmidt forming the Franklin Committee to investigate what was going on. He was investigating what happened to the money. Why did that credit union fail? He wasn't investigating the prostitution of children. He wasn't investigating uh, satanic activity and so on. But what did he find? As his investigator got into it, he began to bring videotapes, tapes of children who told of the things that went on in the Franklin Credit Union itself. They have a bedroom in it. He said it's probably one of the few savings and loans in the country with its own bedroom. And then more and more information began to come out about Larry King, Larry Lawrence King, 
a black man who sang the national anthem at the 1984 and 1988 presidential conventions. And I have a picture of him here with Maureen Reagan right next to him. Now that man brought children to the 84 convention and to the 88 convention for the purposes of prostitution. He had a big inaugural ball party in Washington, D.C. and rented a huge house and spent millions of dollars to bring children from Nebraska there as prostitutes. And what happened when all of this came to light? The FBI stepped in and cross-examined every one of the children and told them if they did not recant their testimony, they would be liable to as much as 530 years in prison for perjury. They were grilled for hour on hour. The ones who didn't recant ended up either dead or in jail. So definitely in my opinion, a conspiracy here. I, right. I, have to say, I have to say there's a conspiracy. Um, if not a direct conspiracy, certainly a, a loose-knit conspiracy um, by the mere fact that these uh, kids, uh, if it's true, and I, I have a tendency to believe it is true, these kids were transported to Los Angeles where they obtained drugs, where they were involved in ritual ceremonies. They were transported to Washington, D.C., where they were they claimed they were molested. And, uh, and there were some, obviously some top political figures involved in this sort of thing. Here is a piece of information that came to me in the mail. It came from the investigation by the Franklin Committee of the Nebraska Legislature. It was verified in its authenticity by Republican Senator Lauren Schmidt of the unicameral of the Nebraska Legislature who verified the truth and authenticity of it. I want to give you a picture of true horror. But children were not merely abused. One victim described an incident at a farm near Elkhorn, Nebraska in 1981 or 82 where a 10-year-old boy was repeatedly sodomized and beaten by older men. He finally lay crying with blood streaming from his rectum. One of the men took up a pitchfork, playfully playing with him at first, but finally sticking one tine into him. While the boy screamed and the other men stood around and laughed, finally the whole pitchfork was stuck through him, killing him. Snuff films were involved as well. Another young boy was taken by someone in the King Circle from Nebraska to another city and forced to perform oral sex on a man. As the abuser reached orgasm, he shot the boy in the head with a pistol, all of which was filmed. Our private investigation has led us down all of these trails years ago to the snuff films, to a lot of things and many of our friends and associates bailed out on us because they didn't want to hear it. Um, it was too horrible to want to be close to either one of us. Well, the security blanket was uh, rippled and uh, people, I mean, even when you talk about the police, they, uh, they don't want to talk about it because that, that upsets their security in, in the system. Uh, it's just like, uh, if somebody found out that a fire department wouldn't come to your house if you had a fire, same kind of deal. One more thing. This report states it reaches high into Republican Party circles in Washington, D.C. Pedophilia owns this nation. Pedophilia is part of what we're talking about. And the hiding of the pedophiles is being done by none other than the FBI. It was sometime in August of the year that Johnny was kidnapped uh, when uh, a neighbor lady saw this car sitting there with California plates on it, taking pictures of many different things, but uh, Johnny was on his paper out at the same time. And uh, apparently she was shooting pictures or, you know, she was pointing the, the camera at him, whether she took the picture or not, we pre presume she was. And the lady called the police department about it. They never ever checked it out. Then they lost the license plate number. The lady had wrote it down. And after this ordeal, uh, she didn't have the license plate number anymore either. And uh, then roughly a month later on September 5th, 
1982, that's when Johnny uh, was kidnapped on his paper route. And uh, the people that were there that morning at the corner said that the only thing they saw in this guy's car was a brown Manila envelope laying on the front seat. Whether it was a picture, whether it was a work order to kidnapping or whatever it was, uh, we presume it was probably both. And at the time of the abduction, um, Johnny left the house at about 5.55 in the morning and headed towards the paper drop area. And when he got part way there, a man in a car had pulled over and asked him for directions. And then Johnny continued on the sidewalk up to the corner where the other boys were waiting to pick up their papers. The man then took off in his car and evidently circled way around our housing block and another one to come back to the same area and pull in up on 42nd Street where Johnny and another boy and a 44-year-old attorney was standing. He was picking up his son's papers. The man pulled over to the curb, opened up the door, shut off the engine, and put his feet out on the ground and began to engage all of them in conversation. Mostly it was about asking for directions. And the two witnesses had a very, very good look at the man because it was under a street light. And that became very valuable later because they did work with a composite artist that we hired to construct the composite drawing which the authorities now use. Um, they don't use the one that they did. And um, the man was Mediterranean or Spanish, probably in his 40s, just impeccably dressed, very neat. The car was very neat. The witnesses had an exact description of the car. Um, the man spoke with a very slurred speech pattern. At that point, the lawyer left the area, taking the papers with him for his sons. And our son made the statement to the other boy, you know, this guy's weird. There's something wrong here. I'm going home. He was scared. So Johnny took off down the street to head for home, which at that point he was headed north. And he had to go one block north and then turn and go another block west to get back up to our block. He got halfway down the street and the boy that was sitting at the corner, who was 16, heard our dog begin to growl, who was walking along with Johnny. And at that point he looked up and he saw a very, very tall, thin man. He estimated him to be probably about eight or 10 inches taller than Johnny. Came out from between two houses and fell in behind Johnny and followed him down the street and around the corner out of sight. Then just seconds later, two other boys approached from a different area to get their papers and they witnessed Johnny sitting on his wagon slumped over like he was sick. They didn't waved at him and continued on. Nobody suspected impending danger. They got to the corner and at that moment they all heard the slamming of a car door and the screech of tires and that same blue car came right through the stop sign, turned left which was north and headed out of town. The noise awakened a boy who was living at the corner in a house in the upstairs and his bedroom window faced that street and when he looked out all he saw was Johnny's wagon and the car taking off. They had already thrown him in the car. And with all of that evidence, we still did have difficulty getting an initial fast reaction and investigation started with the police. Um, they, they, they wanted to tend to believe that any kid that age would run away. In the face, you know, in the face of five witnesses that each saw a part of this whole kidnapping take place. It was an incredible um, situation. The time frame uh, basically was somewhere between 6.03 and 6.06 or 7 is when apparently Johnny was abducted. We didn't find out about it until 6.30 or somewhere in that area when one of our neighbors called and wanted to know where their Sunday paper was because Johnny always delivered the papers on time and so I got my car and went up to the corner, found the wagon with the papers in it and paper bag and all these type of things. And uh, came back home and I told Marina, I says, call the police, there's something wrong. I can't find Johnny, but his wagon's up there. And what even made me do that? Instead of going around and looking and all around, but I, uh, I just felt something was real 
because the dog was back, and that was what mm -hmm. really surprised me. The old minister dash out, she had come back home. And you see, Johnny was the type of kid that was very responsible. He had a perfect service award for every month that he had had the newspaper. So it wouldn't be like him to abandon a whole wagon full of newspapers and go lollygag in some place. We knew our son, and we knew something was wrong immediately. It took about 45 minutes for the police to come over, and our house is 10 blocks from the police station. From the time I called the police until they got here, I had already called for our older son to be sent home from his place of employment because we knew that the family was going to have to pull together. I had called our daughter at college and made arrangements for her fiancé to bring her right here. I had called the district manager at the newspaper and I had found out the names of all the kids that picked up papers at the corner and I had already had a phone conversation with <coughs> them. And in that phone conversation they described the man, the way he spoke, the car, the color of the car, what the man was wearing. Everything was very detailed because it was very fresh. And I had all that information before the police ever walked into the house. Um, we weren't prepared for what was going to happen next. And that was basically nothing. I mean, it was up to John and I at that point in time to go to the press and beg for help in, in having them show Johnny's picture so that people knew he was missing. Um, there was not the adequate measures taken initially. Uh, the Des Moines Register was very concerned about who was going to be delivering the papers like the next day. And uh, they told us we had to find a replacement. We had to find a replacement under those situations. I told them where to put the papers. And the press is. <laughs> In August of 1984, and it was about four days before the Martin boy was kidnapped from Des Moines, I was asked to fly to Washington, D.C. and testify at a Senate hearing. And it was organized crime hearings and their possible connection to kidnap cases. I wasn't asked to come in for all of the missing children hearings, which had been held earlier in the year. But they had me come for this other one, which I thought was kind of strange at the time. But our private detective had been digging up a lot of information showing an overall network in the country and that Johnny was a possible victim of that network as opposed to just a random pedophile running around Des Moines. So when I presented what we had in our case, the person that followed me in presenting was a member of the FBI. And what they had laid on the table about this size was nothing but one publication after another after another that had all been taken from a pedophile in a raid that the FBI conducted. One of the things was a book on how to molest small children without leaving marks on them. We're talking toddlers. How to coerce or abduct a child into a car. The how-to books that teach pedophiles to do this. Paraphernalia that would be used in some type of sexual torture for children. And then the other interesting thing that was there on the table was a book of pictures of kids who had not yet been kidnapped. The statement was that you could order a kid out of that book. And the interesting thing is that from time to time when we do hear of reports of children being photographed either on a playground and or walking to and from school or just whatever, in many cases there is an abduction attempt on the same child up to three weeks, a month, or two months later. Did anybody give any indication of how much it cost to buy one? Because what I'm saying is that this is not going to be done cheaply and it's not going to be done no free. We've heard estimates of about fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars per child depending on the features and the looks of that child, the innocence, prepubescent children. Um, there are also, and this has been documented by a number of private investigators who researched it, that periodically auctions take place in the United States. Different places they move around, they don't just set up shop in one spot and publish and notice that there's going to be an auction. It's done very secretively and they might run 10 to 20 kids at a time through an auction block and the buyers can be from foreign countries or whatever and then the child would never have a hope of ever getting back to his own country. There are internment camps around the country where they keep these people after they kidnap them. And I've heard of one in Des Moines, Iowa, as a matter of fact. Um, I, know, I know of one in West Virginia. 
I know of one in uh, Nevada n near the Arizona border. I know of some in California and also in the state of Washington. And uh, these are well organized. They're, uh, they're camps where they keep the people behind cages. And um, I've been told that they're involved in brainwashing in these particular camps. And many of the victims that are kidnapped end up in these camps. NAMBLA stands for North American Boy Love Association. And um, this was brought to our attention. It was acquired through an underground connection. And it was, the date on here is June of 1983, just a few months after Johnny was taken. And on the front page of NAMBLA's bulletin, down at the bottom, they are warning all of their members, of which Iowa has many, all of their members not to, in any way, comply with the FBI and, and submit to any kind of questioning on the Johnny Gosh case. And they were very careful to spell it out, Johnny Gosh case. Then this is continued over here on page three. There's another section about Johnny Gosh. Now why would a rag like this need to warn their members not to talk about our case unless there's some connection? Uh, this is written to Dr. Judy Ann Densengerber, who, by the way, is on the hit list of the NAMLA people. I am writing you at present to request of, at the request of an organization that is not interested in advancing the cause of kiddie porn for the sake of the exploitation of children, but rather for the social recognition of children's sexuality, for the acceptance of the sexual expression of adults that desire sexual relations of a loving and tender nature with children and ultimately for raising human beings without the typical sexual impediments that are so prevalent in our Judeo-Christian society. In other words, uh, if it's good for us, it's good for the nation. Now, I have actual records of a meeting of the Man Boy Association in 1979. They had $620 in their bank account as of that time. By 1989, they were depositing $5 million in the Franklin Credit Union in Nebraska. What for? To pay for children kidnapped across the country, to pay for taking children out of Boys Town and out of Girls Town to be used for prostitution purposes and porn films. Now, John and Noreen Gosh are well-to-do people, well-together people, and Johnny was their uh, son late in life. So they were able to put a great deal of resources and a great effort into putting information across the country about the kidnapping of Johnny. They said we had to sell candy and have fundraisers and so on to put out all those posters and everything that we put out across the United States. But in 1987, the word came down from on high from people who were following the Goshes and following the Gosh family. And that was, you shut up right now and say no more about the North American Man Boy Love Association. The threats came throughout the year of 1987 and 88. We had a lot of activity on the case. We were moving in a direction where um, we thought we really were going to close in on the who did it part. So that became a threat to whoever was responsible to want to stop us. And there was harassment that went on towards us that you wouldn't believe. People would come here in the middle of the night and they would throw things at the house to wake us up. And then we would see them out in the backyard. And by the time we could get outside or the police could get here, the people would be gone. The phone call in question came shortly after John and I had made a trip out of state and it was business on Johnny's case and we had gotten to this one state and uh, John said I don't feel comfortable at this hotel I don't know why I just don't want to stay here so we went up to another hotel and checked in and did our business and came home we were only gone three days but two days later I got a call, that one came to my office where there were no taping facilities. That call came to my office and a voice said, it was a male, very gruff voice, and he said, um, you made it very difficult for us to watch you. You switched hotels on us. 
He then proceeded to tell us what rental car agency we used, where we went, where we ate. In other words, details enough to prove to us that somebody was looking over our shoulder. And for what reason, we didn't know other than we might be hitting pay dirt. We might be getting close to something. Because that would be an indication, we've got to stop these people, we've got to throw the fear of God into them. And then over the period of months, other family members, um, we received threats on them that if we did not back out of certain aspects of this investigation, that someone else would be hurt. Well, we already knew that they had access to our comings and goings, that this could be very easily done. We would come home different nights, and our porch light would be out. Um, we would always leave that porch light burning. That was kind of a symbol of hope that we started in the beginning of the case. It wouldn't be burned out, it would be screwed out. They, somebody would actually come up here and remove the bulb and see when we would get home we think, oh, the bulb burned out, we need to replace it in the morning. John would go out there and the whole bulb was gone. I mean, insidious things were going on. We would get a phone call in the middle of the night and somebody would just do this. Just tap, they'd say nothing. Within 20 minutes, somebody would be in our backyard, throwing stuff at the house, making sure that we knew they were there. The police traced the calls, and they told us that every phone call came from a phone booth within a radius of our home, the, of a driving time of about 15, 20 minutes. And he said, uh, the lieutenant that was in charge of our case said, if we knew which phone booth to stake out next, we'd wait there for him, but they use a different one each time. This went on for months, absolutely months. And um, finally, the culmination of it took place one week. John was in Denver, and it happened to be in August. And um, it started off the beginning of the week. I came home one day, and the phone rang, and it was a well-known man in Des Moines who has walked both lines of the law, and he's, he's well-known. And he identified himself on the phone, taking the risk that if the phone was tapped, you know, that people would recognize his name. And he said, I don't want to scare you, but someone has put out the word to make a hit on you, meaning me. And he said, whatever it is that you need from us, there's no strings attached for your protection. And I said, well, you know, what is this about? And he said, just do not leave town. Do not go out of town for any reason. And that was his warning. Well, I hung up the phone, and I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking, okay, all this other stuff had been going on for months. And I'm thinking to myself, now who's playing a joke on us, you know? Because it was just so ridiculous. A couple minutes later, the, police, the phone rang again. It was the police. And they said, please stay there at the house. We're coming over. They came over, and they had received the same phone call from the same man, telling them that they better, you know, circle the wagons because something was going to happen. Something was impending. And then is when, it was at that time, I had, I had also been filling in the police lieutenant on all these other things that had been going on for months and the threats, and they, so they had a log of it already as in a progression. It was at that point, that week, that there was a much more concern shown for us and a level of cooperation that came between the police, the FBI, and us for the first time on the case. I was told to just go to my office and home, not to go anywhere else at night, anywhere, nothing. So I didn't. That Thursday of that week, it was in the middle of the night, the phone rang, and it was a man who said that he wanted me to get on a flight, leaving Des Moines, and he gave the flight number, fly into Kansas City on a small plane, and then take an Eastern airliner from there to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Rent a car, and he told me which agency to use, take that car and go to the Holiday Inn, and he specified which one, and wait to check in and wait, check in under my own name and wait to be contacted. That he had information about Johnny. Well, there was the invitation to go out of town that they were waiting for. And um, I called the police right away. I taped the co tape recorded the call, and I called the police right away, and they said, get dressed, get ready, we're on our way, we'll get the FBI, and we'll all be there. So they came, and um, I told them again what the man said, and they said, well, we have to decide what to do. And um, 
The man had said that he had made a reservation for me on the phone in my name. So we're sitting here deliberating about what to do with the FBI. They wanted me to get on the plane and go to take the trip. And it was the police lieutenant who just sat here and just pounded the table and said, you cannot send her. You have to send a policewoman dressed like her because they want her to take the small plane into Kansas City. He said, there's a lot of ways to get to Tulsa other than using that route. But they, they wanted me on that small plane because it, it, it unloaded out on the tarmac. They didn't use a jet jetway. And the police here were afraid that there might be a sniper in Kansas City waiting. And if I made it somehow miraculously through Kansas City, that there would be somebody waiting in Tulsa and I'd never come back to Des Moines again. Well, the FBI said that they couldn't make a decision locally. They would have to go back to their office and call Washington for instructions. So at that point, I said, well, did anybody bother to call the airline and find out if this turkey really did make a reservation for me? So they called the airline from here, and the reservationist said that someone had called in on the 800 number after midnight and made a reservation in my name on that flight. So then they knew this was serious. And um, by the time the day progressed, the flight left at 4.59, so they had to make some fast decisions. They finally did agree to send a policewoman, but it was only after the FBI offered me money to go. They offered to pay for all of my flight, food, rental car, everything, and send a plain clothesman to stay with me at all times. And I refused. I said, no, this is what the warning was earlier this week. I'm not going to make the I was advised not to, and I'm not going to. So they sent a policewoman in my place, and they caught the guy who approached her, and he's now serving time in the Oklahoma Penitentiary. Lives are trying to figure out. It was a panel discussion uh, on Satanism and pedophilia, a tough topic on Michelson in the morning. Information from a panelist divulged key facts regarding the 1982 kidnapping of paperboy Johnny Gosh. Information Noreen Gosh says her investigators have been secretly working on. Author John Zielinski says it involves an informant close to the case. He has identified him as Johnny Gosh and said, I saw him over the years as I traveled the country. He might have accompanied the man who kidnapped Johnny Gosh when he was only about 13 or 14 years old. Paul Bonacci has a photographic memory. He can remember every date, every place, every person, every scar. And he has identified Johnny Gosh. He helped to kidnap Johnny Gosh. He was only 12 or 13 at the time, and he was taken along. He also identified the fact that in 1987, when Mrs. Gosh was threatened, when they were told their children would be killed if they revealed that they thought the North American Man-Boy Love Association was the kidnap ring, at that very time, Paul Bonacci was making a pornographic film with Johnny Gosh, who was a slave in a house of prostitution in Colorado. Uh, I'm Judy Ann Denson Gerber. I am a psychiatrist and a lawyer and have been practicing since 1967. At that time, my major interest was in drug abuse, and I founded the Odyssey House programs across the United States, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and in Hong Kong. By 1985, however, I began to see a new phenomenon, and that phenomenon was that the patients that I was seeing many of whom had disassociative disorders, post-traumatic stress, which I've talked about, but also multiple personality, uh, and therefore could only remember fragments of what had happened to them, but these fragments were coming out in their 30s, began to remember ritualistic cult abuse. And to my uh, sadness, having been a religious major in college, I realized that there were many people who used their children in uh, the worship of the Prince of Darkness, Satan, Lucifer, uh, Isis, which is an Egyptian prince of the, uh, princess of darkness, actually, married to the king of the underworld, and that we had many, many victims of this type of activity. Uh, someone who had uh, knew that this was my field and knew that there were implications of ritual and uh, satanic cult abuse in the Nebraska Franklin Credit Union uh, scandal 
and uh, embezzlement of funds, uh, and that the major witness uh, in that, Paul Benassi, uh, happened to be a victim himself at a very early age of child molestation, uh, had been a boy prostitute, uh, had been in porn uh, pictures, had also, uh, according to his, his statements, uh, participated in five cult murders uh, and was a multiple personality uh, very much like Sybil is the one that I'm sure most people will know Three Faces of Eve that because he was a multiple personality and since I was an expert in disassociation and multiplicity would I see him for the purposes of whether or not uh, he was credible uh, when interviewing Paul Benassi he definitely said that he had seen uh, Gosh, and he had seen Gosh on two separate occasions uh, in a child white slave house. Uh, he also described that Gosh had an unusual birthmark. This birthmark w was not part of the general information. And when he shared that with Mr. Gosh and then eventually with Mrs. Gosh, they said that it had to be their son. Now, for uh, this would have been about um, at least four years after the initial kidnapping occurred. To me, the fact that he had seen uh, this young man alive in a child white slave house could describe a physical uh, aspect that was not uh, a usual one, that the parents themselves uh, said that they believed that he had seen their son definitely deserve to be looked into. I mean, that isn't something you can just uh, turn aside. Uh, interestingly enough, I had a very, uh, what will I say, uh, goose pimply kind of experience with Benassi in that when we were talking about another very famous child, Eten Paez, who is uh, Kate, as some people pronounce it, whose parents have, as the Gashas have, spent uh, endless hours uh, searching for their lost son and much pain. Uh, actually, I did ask, have you seen him? And uh, he said he didn't know and he wasn't sure. And then I received a letter from him uh, about a month later uh, from many of his different personalities. They write me separately. And one of them said to me, uh, Dr. Densker, I wasn't totally honest with you. Uh, I didn't tell you everything. Uh, because I had seen you on December 28, 1982 at a rally at the Holiday Inn in New York uh, and you were pointed out to me by David Thorstadt, the head of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, which is called NAMULA, uh, which I have the distinction and honor in my mind to be public enemy number one of. I do not agree that uh, young boys should be uh, aroused to erection at six months of age when they're being diapered by their mothers so that they learn what uh, the, in quotes, equipment is for, end quotes. I just think that uh, this is uh, a travesty, uh, will increase the Oedipal conflict, that this is not something mothers should do. This is not something that should happen to children when they're being diapered. Children should be loved without being sexually approached. But he said to me in 1990 that he had seen me in uh, actually in 1982 at such and such a place at such and such a time and had been told that I was marked to die uh, and therefore he was afraid of what he could or couldn't tell me and what would happen to me. I went back and checked my diary and I was exactly where he said I was. Those are the kinds of things uh, that convinced me that there was a great deal in what Benassi was saying in Nebraska that had to be further investigated and that to bring him up on charges for lying for the grand jury when they haven't investigated. I'll give you a perfect example. One of the alleged perpetrators was also told uh, by everyone uh, that he had a large abdominal scar. Uh, it would seem to me, I don't, I don't think you have to be a physician, that if you're told by someone that X has a large abdominal scar and that he is a perpetrator of pedophilia, all you have to do is look at the man's abdomen. If he does he or does he not have the scar? No one to this day has ever looked at this person's abdomen, nor has he been willing 
to show his abdomen. I mean, if I were an innocent person accused of a heinous crime of uh, constantly buying boy prostitutes, I'd sure as shoot be willing to show whether or not I had an appendectomy scar and abdominal scar if I didn't have one. It would only be if I had one that I would stay buttoned up. Okay. You all know what a snuff film is? Snuff film is what it implicates. You snuff out a candle, well, you snuff out a life in this film. And Paul Bonacci has taken part in a film in which he had sex with a boy both before and after he was killed. Uh, as I got to learn know more about Benassi and he wrote me letters and I, uh, I listened to his descriptions of the um, rights of the different sex that he had been in, of the killings, uh, of who uh, performed the fetal Eucharist, which is the uh, actual drinking of the blood and eating or cannibalizing of the child or the newborn or the abortus, uh, my, uh, or an adult in some instances. Uh, I discovered that everything he said fit into, one would say, the traditional rites of the Antichrist sex. He had conducted human sacrifice. She said, I gave him all kinds of quizzes, which if he wasn't part of the satanic circle and he hadn't achieved the various steps of Satanism, he wouldn't know. I said to him, did you ever eat the eyes? And he said, no, because my other personality, Christian, wouldn't let me go to the ceremony that night. Now, eating the eyes means that you're high up in the hierarchy of Satanism and you pluck the eyes out of a human and eat them. We were going to discuss, say, communion in the Roman Catholic Church. It would be the same in Rome and in England and in France and in Australia and in China and wherever Roman Catholicism were practiced. Well, the Satanists do the same thing so that when they are performing certain rites, they have uh, the dagger, and it's a similar dagger throughout the world uh, with which they do the killings. They have the commun communion plate, which has uh, certain markings on it. Uh, they have the chalice. Uh, they have the st uh, stilo or stiletto uh, with which a newborn's uh, child is punctured. A uh, heart is punctured by the mother, actually, of this child. That mother can be as young as 12 or 13, which is very frightening. And then she draws out that blood. Uh, there is a, other rituals which uh, he discussed. And only certain priests or certain levels in the uh, hierarchy are permitted to do those rituals. And he knew every single ritual correctly and who was to do them. So there was no doubt in my mind that he had uh, intimate personal knowledge. Uh, I've talked to many, many Paul Bonacci's who told the same basic story. Uh, people from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Florida, Texas, um, Northern California, Southern California, Washington, and people are telling the same story throughout the United States. It used to be that the bodies were cremated. There were arrangements with, uh, with uh, funeral parlors, and the children in Nebraska who were involved in this describe situations in which they had a human sacrifice in the house. They hacked the body up. They stuck it in a couple of gunny sacks, uh, plastic bags, good husky ones, and took it out to the car and took it away to the funeral parlor and cremated the whole remains. There are children who describe being trained on cats to insert a knife up the rectum of a cat and rip it open as a training to doing the same with live babies. And the woman who got on cable access television and said, the foster children I've had in my home, and she was a very brave lady, and she took the worst foster children, the foster children that no one else would take. And one by one, they began to tell her about being involved in these satanic things. And she said, one girl at Christmas time lay on the floor and scream for two and a half hours. She said, I can't get the sound of the babies crying out of my head. Christmas is the worst time because that's when we kill the most babies. The children I have talked to have all had to murder before the age of two. I mentioned that last week and mm -hmm. we, we kind of went right on past it. Mm -hmm. 
that is something that is beyond anything I could comprehend. Right. But in some way, whether with the help of an adult's hand over theirs, or by having them practice, by getting them excited to be part of the adult scene, these children have never seen a normal life, for goodness sakes, uh, they do murder. And the evil thing that happens is, they really believe they want to. They, they want to do what the older people are doing, and they're praised for that. And that becomes their goal, to be like the adults and to do these horrible things. There is a little part in them that I believe we all have, that natural, good, God-given part that knows it's wrong. But in a group and in the excitement of everything, they want to do that. They enjoy the sex. Children are capable of enjoying the sex. That was something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, why would they fight against it? A child will eat a bag of candy if you give it to them. They will take part in these things willingly. When they get out and begin to talk, that's very difficult for them to realize. Uh, we didn't realize it at first, that they actually wanted to do that, and that is part of the very sophisticated brainwashing job that they do on all of these children. The part that made me to believe this child's story was that when he finally said, this baby, he talked about several, but this particular baby had been killed, stabbed again, different way, but stabbed. He curled up in a fetal position. He was nine years old when he was telling the story. He curled up in a fetal position, and his eyes got real glazed, and he said, they cooked that baby on the grill. Oh, my gosh. And I thought, he has really flipped out. I mean, I didn't know. And he said, oh, gross, it smelled like rotten chicken or rotten deer. Mm. He then went on and told us how they would cut out the heart or they would cut off the sex organs. They would save them in the refrigerator, in the freezer. And this is a very typical thing that these kids talk about. They worship the sex organs. I suppose they are so into themselves, and it is life and nature and all of that. I don't, I don't, and it's very decadent, deviant. It is nothing a Christian person would care to even hear about. So that is part of the reason I'm sure that they do that. Um, but they, he witnessed that, and they kept it for another ceremony. They will always use these bodies one way or another. I didn't get any answers from that child about what happened to the bodies. Where did they go? Eventually. Um, the little ones that I was talking about first talked about throwing the babies in the fire. And I asked about that, and uh, you mean they were dead and then they threw them in the fire, and, and the littlest one said, no, no, them was alive, and them threw them, you know, like this. The most horrible story about fire that I have to tell, and this is extremely, extremely disturbing, um, was a little girl, she is a teenager, as she was telling me this story. And she was describing the barn where they used to go to have their meetings. And uh, she told how they would gather outside of the barn and do their chanting. And then as they went on into the barn, they would be split into different groups. And uh, she was never with any of her family. They all went to different places. And I asked her where she had to go, and she said, oh, I was always in the burning room. And as she went on and described the burning room, uh, I thought, how she came out of this with any sanity at all, I don't know. She was very small, very small child. Uh, they would take young children, and I were probably talking preschoolers, I don't think, that they dealt much with the older ones. And they would hang them from a rafter in this barn. And there would be as many as five to ten hung in a row. And they would be fully clothed, which is unusual because frequently they are all naked. Mm -hmm. The children, like this girl, were all given candles. And, and you can picture the ceremony as she described it. And the candles were lit one by one. Then the adults would go forward and they would pour from a cup some liquid on each of the children's clothing, which is obviously gasoline or kerosene. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that then. And then after whatever it was they had to do, they would give the signal and these others would have to go forward and set the children on fire. Yeah. When they were done, they would just cut them down. The first child that this girl had to kill was a cousin, a little cousin. Uh, you know, what does that do to you? What, what does it do to your insides? Mm -hmm. But you couldn't object because the children that objected were killed. Yeah. 
frequently, she said, people would come. They'd come as families, like we would go to some big festive gathering, not knowing that their child would be sacrificed. And she would describe the screams of mm -hmm. the parents when they realized that their child had been killed. Mm -hmm. And she talked about them being cut down and how they would draw a circle around the body. And when, and when she first told me those things, I knew she was telling the truth. It wasn't that, but I didn't understand it. And I still can't tell you every answer, but I know that circles are important. And during these rituals, mm -hmm. they will draw the circles or in some way they will have a circle because they believe that these demons that come can't break through the circle to right. harm them. She had also told about how the parents would kneel outside that circle where the child had fallen to like pray to the child is what she said. I've been told by people that know a lot more than I do that the reason for all of this death and murder is because of the belief in the demons and the power that they can get from that. And these people believe that the more innocent the victim, the more horrible the death, the closer you are at the moment of death, the more magic is released and the more spiritual power, power they get. Are working with the North American Man-Boy Love Association to market children and they're also running the drugs. There are certain, like for instance, Jerry Samando with Chicago Police Department. He's, he's certainly doing something about this. Uh, the Sheriff's Office in Los Angeles and the LAPD have a, an officer who's in charge of satanic crimes. Uh, unfortunately, many of these officers do not have a real good grasp on the situation. Many times uh, they have a tendency to believe that it's more like street gangs where they write the uh, satanic graffiti on the wall, but it's much deeper than that, as you know. Uh, there are uh, police officers. Isn't, isn't, uh, just let me stop you here. Isn't the street gang essentially just the bottom rung, the delivery boys in this? Well, there's various levels of, of uh, this ritualistic activity, as you, I'm sure you're aware right. of. Right, and we're talking oftentimes about uh, important people, doctors, lawyers. Uh, Absolutely. It goes much further. Uh, beyond the street gangs and people realize that but, it goes up into the professional people. But the street gangs are operating with the drugs and with the, ch the child kidnapping, I believe. That's right. And I just, in Des Moines, I have found an area where the gangs meet underneath the bridge. And it said on there, and missing children are dead. I hope I'm going to sicken you in a minute. You may want not to watch all of this. But this is a video that comes out of the video store in Washington, Iowa, and your 15-year-old or your 14-year-old could go and check it out because it is not a rated video. It is a documentary of a life situation or a death situation. A woman. And this is a human sacrifice. And this is part of the video called Faces of Death. Cutting her open. This was shown uh, to a group of us in Nebraska, of the Nebraska Leadership Conference. I went out there to attend this to find out what was going on. And Ely, or a Kansas City homicide detective, showed this. And he said, this is available in any town in America. And my first thought on seeing this it must be a porn store. It must be a town big enough to have a pornographic uh, video store. And uh, that's not true. Does anybody know Shreve, Ohio? Do you know how small Shreve, Ohio is? Do you know Millersburg? Do you know Goshen? All of these towns have it. Do you know Washington? They don't have a video store in Kelowna, so there's no place I could look. Iowa City all over the place. It is everywhere in this country. And what's more, when I step up to a store and ask if they've got it, I stopped in Millersburg at a grocery store and uh, they said, we don't have it. We don't stock that kind of thing. And I said, how many people are asking for it? And who is seeing this? Young people and what is happening after they see something like this. 
Um, there's every indication that the you know, Colts uh, groups have um, established preschools across the country and even overseas. I know of a preschool in Australia and I know of some in Europe that were actually organized by Americans. And um, they use these preschools, number one, to uh, recruit the children, ages two to four to five, and also they use these children in their uh, ritual ceremonies. Going on 22 years old, she's been in solitary confinement longer than any other woman in Nebraska history. What she did was talk to the Nebraska legislature, talk to the Franklin Committee, and tell them what had happened to her from the age of 12. The FBI warned her she'd spend a long time in prison if she didn't recant. She's a born-again Christian. She's been in solitary confinement with nothing to read but her Bible. And they thought, we're going to break this lady. We're going to break this girl. And she said, not till I die will I give up. Will I recant my story? And there are a group of people in Nebraska called the Nebraska Leadership Council. And they're working now with a petition, and I'm supposed to have a copy of that petition soon sent to me. And in that petition, they're going to ask for her unconditional release. Now, <clears throat> what I'm saying to you is Alicia Owens is America's youngest political prisoner. Who put her there? The FBI and others. Why? Because one of the things she said was, I saw a vice president, then a president at these parties in Washington, D.C. Now, Judy Ann Denson Gerber confirms this. She's a friend of a president. She grew up with him, and she says, I am rethinking my relationship to him because of what I now know is going on. And I was told, don't mention names. So I'm going to say to you, in this state, I feel that everyone from the governor on down should be voted out of office. In the state of Nebraska, I feel the same thing. In the U.S. Congress, I feel the same thing. Found one newspaper man, not one journalist in this state, not the Cedar Rapids Gazette, not the Des Moines Register, not the Quad City Times, not the Dubuque Telegraph Herald, all of which have run stories on me, not one of them willing to pick up the telephone and make one single telephone call to begin verifying the truth of what I'm saying. I have been dismissed out of hand. Bill Casey, publisher of the Daily Iowan, is so incensed by my very appearance that he goes absolutely stark raving mad. You're gone. Out of here. Yes, sir. No, what no. Reason, I have, what reason you have you, no right in your videotape. What reason do you have to kick me out when I am only seeking to give you... Most people do not come in here with cameras. There's a court you, injunction against you, John Zelensky, for giving this information. That's what the court told me. Now get out of this building. The cops are going to be here in 30 seconds. It is not the information that I am trying to give you now. It has nothing to do... I don't want to talk to you. You've been a pain in my ass for four or five years. I don't want you in here. I'm out. I'm saying... You that have no... The, you this, turn that off or I'm going to punch you. I want to ask you this. Do you, in effect, and this is what I found out, I went into the Daily Island to give them this tape. Now this you harassed her. Turn it off, I said. You're going to get this it. This is a public building. Yes, but this is not public space. I'm not in that building. I'm in the world. We're not in that All right. your space. The there. cops will be here in a minute. Okay. Now we can... We'll go up and... You know this guy? We'll go yeah. up and talk to You know to he's crazy? We'll go well, up you're and talk to people. I'm threatening him because this guy's threatened us for five years. What have you have I no threatened? right in our newsroom. What have I threatened? I have hey, you have, you have simply, libeled me. Hey, listen, buddy. If I have libeled you, then I suggest you have you. no money. Your lawyer told me you have not a cent in the world. Don't bother suing you. Okay, let's go. Go. Out. Now, why is it? You're that a man of your supposed stature. I do the same thing that Jim Leach's office does. Everybody in the state, they, they, they have no business talking to you. They have no right to no. You're you, crazy. Are you saying that newspapers have no business listening to anything I have hey, to you, say? Hey, when you come here, you talk to us for three hours. As soon as we disagree right. with you, you start calling us motherfucker okay. and every other word in the world. Oh, You're the no. craziest guy. Hey, you I have never heard the word motherfucker or anything like that from me. I, I do no. not use the kind of language you use. That's not your land, and you know now, it. I don't have to argue with you, okay. Jimmy. Now, 
I want I want to say one thing with you do. Want to listen to that? No. Then well, why do you okay. put it in my well, face? Do you want to listen to that? Yeah, what give it to me, I'll listen to it. But okay. I don't want to have to sit here and listen to you. Okay, that's I'll, fine. That's I'll mail us back to you. You have your address? You got a card to give me? This goes along with it. All right. Now this does not come from me. Did you turn it off? And I have confirmed with Senator Lauren Schmidt of the Nebraska legislature the truth of this matter that I give you. I now have been talking to John and Noreen Gosh, and I will be taping John and Noreen Gosh about the kidnapping of children and about its association with Iowa. All right. We will listen to this and we'll send it back to you. All right. And you will send the letter saying that you have listened to it and yes. send it back. And yet, what have I said of Bill Casey? That Bill Casey has acted inappropriately, that he has acted irresponsibly. I have not called him names, I have not made threats, and yet you would think I was threatening to do something horrible to him. Yet all I said is, Bill, will you give me a few minutes of your time? Will you look at this material? Will you make a phone call? Not Bill Casey. Hi, this is Sarah Langenberg, an editor of the Daily Island. And there is a man here videotaping in the newsroom without my permission. And I'd like him to leave him. Well, he's videotaping right now. Do I have to call 911? anything on any topic ever. So get the fuck out of the newsroom right now. I'm waiting for the person me, from uh, the... Why don't you wait outside, the... buddy? Go on, out. Out. not John Robertson of the Cedar Rapids Gazette, not the publisher of the Des Moines Register. No, 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 mustn't touch. And that's why we no longer have freedom of the press.